so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's September 1951 and a month-long downpour has saturated eastern Australia. After a decade of drought, the country's longest waterway, the River Murray, is bearing the full force of the rain. Stretching 2,500 kilometres across three state borders, New South Wales through Victoria and South Australia, towns along the Murray have been ravaged by floodwaters as they rip through houses and destroy crops. Swarms of mosquitoes have been born out of the swamp from the rain and locals are on edge. It was less than a year ago that the Victorian river town of Mildura faced an outbreak of encephalitis. Just 50 miles downstream from there in the town of Renmark, the flood levee has breached. Levels in the Murray are now a full five feet higher than ever recorded. Nine days after the worst of the flood struck, 39-year-old local irrigation worker Charlie Wilson is out on his fishing boat upstream from Renmark. He's enjoying a spot of fishing on a day off from work. Charlie thought the strong current carrying debris like battered tree trunks would be his biggest challenge that day. But soon after he dropped anchor at his favourite spot north of Woolnook Bend, something caught his eye. A mannequin, he first thought, floating face down. As Charlie carefully motored towards it, he realised his discovery was something far more sinister. A naked human body. A corpse with flesh as hard as stone. A nameless, faceless figure whose identity would go on to become the oldest cold case in South Australian history. I'm Emma Gillespie and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In 1951, the discovery of a petrified female body in the raging floodwaters of the Murray triggered an investigation that spanned multiple states and decades. And while evidence suggested foul play, the truth of her identity and what really happened would remain a mystery. With the death of a vital witness in the aftermath of the discovery, leaving the case cold. But seven decades on... Investigative documentary filmmaker and author Peter Butt believes he's uncovered new information and that the facts laid out in his new book, The Petrified Woman, could be key in exhuming the unnamed woman and solving this mystery once and for all. Peter joins us now. And please be aware this conversation does contain mention of suicide. Listener discretion is advised. Peter, let's start with Renmark, where this case unfolds. What sort of a place was that? What is Renmark like? It was rather a small town in the early 1950s. There were about 600 people there. There was a small police station, a courthouse, a couple of hotels. But you wouldn't call it a booming city. It was really a a town. And was it a popular fishing spot? Sure, it was. Professional fishermen had their lots along the river. And that was really destroyed by, I guess, the flood coming up. They had to stop. But on one particular day, an irrigation worker decided to go upriver in his boat, just have a day off. He knew a great fishing spot. And so he went upriver and he made a spectacular find on that day. What was that discovery? What did he find? Well, he'd finished his day fishing. He had a bucket full of fish. He was heading back to Renmark. And he noticed about midstream, five kilometres down from where he started, that there was something floating in the middle of the river. It had a white, shiny feel about it. And he thought, I'll go down a little bit, turn around and come back and inspect what that is. And he realised immediately that it was a body. 
floating face down. So he did what he could to tie it to his boat, took it to the shore and tied it to a tree. Now it's floating face down, so he couldn't tell if it was a male or a female, but he knew that he had to get back to Renmark and alert the police that somebody's died. But there was something unusual about the corpse, wasn't there? I think the fishermen spoke of suspecting it was maybe a mannequin at first. Yes, that's right. When he saw it, he thought it could have been a shop mannequin like he'd seen in Adelaide. There weren't too many shops in Renmark with mannequins in those days. But then he realised that when he touched it, there was something odd about the surface of the skin. It was hard, but it had the feel of a body. And so he knew he had to go to the police and report that. So he does. He alerts the local police in Renmark. What comes next in terms of this grim discovery? How do we dive deeper into understanding that unusual texture, if you will? Okay. Well, firstly, the police had to go there with an undertaker and the fishermen to find the body. They immediately turned it over. They realised that it was a human body, its face was missing, its fingers were missing, its toes were missing, and it looked as if the body had been murdered. So they took it down to the local doctor who did an autopsy. He identified the body as a woman. Now, you couldn't tell initially that it was a woman because the arms were across the breasts. She was between about 40 and 50 years of age. And he suspected that she had been murdered because there was a fracture of the skull. So the question then was, what do we do? So they called the detectives in Adelaide who came up and collected the body and took it down to Adelaide to have the police pathologist do a proper autopsy. And he confirmed that uh, this woman had likely been murdered. The skull fracture was about four inches long. He thought maybe it was a punch or maybe it was some hard implement that had been used to kill the woman. But the skin was the thing that really was unusual for him too. And he'd done 1,800 autopsies since the Second World War. That was about six years. And he'd never seen anything like this. So he assumed that the body had been buried in cold climate, possibly in limestone. That had cause the preservation of the body. But that's where it laid. He couldn't determine anything else. So the police then went to the press. They put the story out about this body. And that's when the case started to unfold. The idea that this corpse was petrified was sort of the headline of the day. As you mentioned, the press get the story. It's covered in local newspapers the mystery of the woman who turned to stone. What did that actually mean? How did it present with this body? And what can you tell me about this idea that she may have been buried somewhere and that may have impacted the okay. texture? Yeah. Petrification is a rare thing. It doesn't happen very often. It can occur in normal soil as long as you know there's no moisture and it's preserved over a long period period of time, there's something in that soil that stops it from disintegrating. In this case, they assumed it was limestone, lime. Lime is an alkaline and it will eat away at flesh. So that may have accounted why her face was missing and her peripherals, her toes, her fingers, and parts of her hand were missing. But the limestone actually preserves the body and it turns it into a kind of, it feels like rock. In some cases around the world, particularly ones that have been found in limestone caves, are quite solid. You could pick up the body and it wouldn't flex. You mentioned that an autopsy revealed she had likely died in some sort of circumstance of foul play or misadventure. There was trauma to the head, but there were also injuries noted on her leg. What can you tell me about those? Okay, yeah, this was a very strange um, markings on her leg, kind of like she'd been laying on the old style wire mattress or a under mattress, you know, which was just an old iron bed used to have wire crisscrossing all the way up. And they thought, well, maybe she's been left on that somewhere. But uh, somebody read about this in the newspaper, a nurse, and she said, I think I can identify those 
markings. And I can therefore identify who this is. She thought it was a woman who'd had a car accident involving a truck some years before, and she'd nursed this woman and said, these markings are very familiar. And the police officer who answered the telephone call said, oh, I don't think that's going to be enough, so we'll let you know, and basically brushed her off. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. But going back to post-autopsy, we know that this is a woman likely in her 40s and 50s, most likely a homicide. We know her height, her build, but what's missing is, of course, her identity. How do investigators begin to try and find out who this is? All you can do is go to the media and give a description and hope that somebody comes forward. Otherwise, because in those days there was no DNA, there was no chance of them doing a scientific investigation to identify this person. There were no markings on the body other than that, those markings on on the thigh of her right leg, nothing else that could have helped identify the person. So they go to the media, they put the story out there, and uh, they hope somebody comes forward. A tram conductor in Adelaide reads the news about this discovery and he has reason to believe that this could be his mother. What can you tell me about that line of inquiry? Who is the tram conductor? His name's Harry Salter. He has two children, a wife, and he believes it's his mother because 17 months earlier she'd written to him to say, She was living actually on a farm some distance away in the middle of nowhere, basically. And she'd written to him to say, we're coming down to Adelaide and we're going off to the Barossa Valley to the festival over there in April. And uh, she didn't turn up. And the police said to him, well, why didn't you make inquiries? And he said, oh, well, I just didn't, you know. And uh, so the police decided to investigate this person. Does that tell us something maybe about the relationship between Harry and his mother, Margaret? Was there maybe a strain there? Yes, there was a strain because he was a good Catholic. In those days, if you were a staunch Catholic, you didn't believe that people should divorce. His mother divorced his father over the fact that his father had a relationship with another woman. So he was angry not so much at his father for having an affair, but more with his mother for divorcing the father. And so the relationship was so strained that he sent her off out of Adelaide up to Renmark in 1939 to basically get her out of his, I guess, spectrum of interest. (laughs) You know, maybe (laughs) another way of saying that is he wanted her to start a new life somewhere else. Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. What do we know about Margaret's life from that point? So she goes through a divorce. She's sort of banished, for lack of a better word, to this town. How does she come to meet her next partner, a man called Russell? She gets a job at the local hospital as a laundress and We don't know the exact circumstances of how she met this man, but his name was Russell Bath, apparently did work at the hospital. They started to socialise together. And at one point, about a year later, he said, I've just taken a job on a property up on the Victorian border, and I was wondering if you'd like to come and be my housekeeper, and if it works out, I'll marry you. Now, there was 11 years difference in the age between the two of them which was quite considerable. She was 11 years older than Russell Bath, but she said, okay, I'll go with you uh, and see how it works out. What do we know then of how their relationship develops? What kind of a place is this property? You mentioned it's near the border between South Australia and Victoria. What unfolds in those years? In those years, I mean, it was a very early days of that property. It was being developed by a World War I veteran who'd been to Egypt during the First World War, and he saw how irrigation could turn a desert into a beautiful farming land. So he was doing the same thing on this desert-like country at Lindsay Point on the Murray River, and he thought, well, here's a great source of water. I can do what the Egyptians did 
and he creates this over 11 year period, creates this beautiful property. When Russell and Margaret turn up there, it's very much the early days. But within about four or five years, the ministers of state governments are turning up and Russell Bath and Margaret are actually showing them around the property because it's such a beautiful example of what you can do in desert country. What did their relationship become? Was there turmoil, especially in the years leading up to 1951 when this corpse is discovered? What did people know from the outside looking in about Russell and Margaret's relationship? Well, most people see it as a a happy, normal relationship, some squabbles. Margaret's granddaughter, also called Margaret, was an eight-year-old and she would go up there on her school holidays, Christmas holidays, and she saw them as just a normal couple. But they occasionally did have arguments, sometimes strong arguments, but you know, from the outside, that was typical of even her own family. So she didn't basically think anything untoward. When did inquiries or investigations shift towards thinking that maybe Russell Bath might know more than he was letting on about Margaret's movements, her whereabouts, her disappearance? Okay. Well, detectives from Adelaide and Victoria and Renmark turn up at the property to interview Russell Bath about Margaret. They discover that Margaret left there with him 17 months earlier. They were going off to the Barossa Valley via Adelaide. But he said when they got to Renmark, she said stop the car and she got out of the car and got into another vehicle and he never saw her again. But he said, she has been seen. She's been seen by two women in different towns in Victoria. So the police think, okay, it all sounds suspicious, but they've got nothing to go on. But while the interview is happening, the detective from Renmark, he's going through the bedrooms and the kitchen and all of the rooms in their house on the property, and he's looking for any evidence. And he finds certain evidence that would suggest that Margaret didn't go anywhere of her own free will, that something has happened. He even finds blood on the lino under a fridge, and he thinks maybe this is where she was killed. Now, they have no proof that the petrified body is Margaret, so it's all assumption at this stage. What is some of the other evidence found in the search of that home that may point towards there being suspicious circumstances or holes in Russell's story? The Renmark detective, whose name is Flint, David Flint, he discovers jewellery, her engagement ring and her wedding ring. And to him, that's quite suspicious. But he said she gave those rings to him while they were in the car at Renmark. And the story kept changing throughout the interview with him. He kept saying different things about what was happening at that Renmark station. He said he gave her some money. She was going off to start a new life, blah, blah, blah. Nothing added up to being fact. It seemed to be he was changing the story minute by minute to try and obfuscate. In the end, I think he said, look, if you think I did it, arrest me. Did they arrest Russell Bath on that day? They did arrest Russell Bath on that day, but not over that case. In his bedroom, he had an unlicensed pistol, which was enough to put him in handcuffs, put him in a police car, take him off to the local police station, which was Mildura, where he was put in a cell to think about his story. You know, the story didn't add up in any regard whatsoever, but the police really couldn't charge him on his false testimony or his changing testimony. Newspapers begin reporting on his name in connection to the case of the petrified woman. He's the only name in the media at that time in connection to the case. What was the public attitude within the community like? How did they respond to that? Well, he was persona non grata because people thought 
okay, Margaret has disappeared and the police suggest that there's something suspicious. So basically people just shunned him. How was his demeanour during this time? You know, as this prime suspect, did he show emotion? Was he maintaining his innocence? He was maintaining his innocence. The story was that she is still alive and I've even received a letter from her from Western Australia. Now, she was in Melbourne one day, (laughs) Western (laughs) Australia in another. He kept changing the story to actually distance himself from her, whereas the police believed every lie that he told was bringing him closer to being charged with murder. He was released on bail and goes back to Lindsay Point, the property where he lived with Margaret. How then does the investigation unfold, given that he provided officers with all of these tales and encounters and alleged witnesses? How do they use those names to move the investigation forward? Okay, so they interview everybody associated with Russell Bath and Margaret. And uh, he mentions a a couple of names, so they go and talk to these people. One of them particularly, after dropping off Margaret, he went off to a property in New South Wales, bringing in the New South Wales police into the story. And they (laughs) So So we've got, just to clarify, Mm. Mildura, Victoria, Renmark in South Australia, and now we're in New South Wales, so Mm. hence why we've got three jurisdictions involved. Yes, which is very unusual. So the police turn up at a property on the New South Wales border and interview a man who said that the day of Margaret's disappearance, at least the day she got into a car at Renmark Police Station, about five hours later or six hours later, he turned up at his property and stayed for a week and he was quite disturbed and uh, he thought, okay, there's something going on here, but Russell just made excuses that, you know, basically she'd left him at Renmark Station, got into another car, and that was it. So the story seemed to fit. Russell's Bath's story was relatively consistent wherever the detectives went. They also went to Victoria and traced a couple of the women who had supposedly seen Margaret. They turned out to be relatives, and their stories didn't shape up too well either. They interviewed everybody that they could. They didn't get any closer, but they got into a maze, which Russell Bath was stuck in the middle of. Were there any witnesses along that trail who police deemed credible or had everyone been tainted by Russell's, I guess, manipulation, this fear that he had had the chance to speak to all of these witnesses first and make sure that everything lined up with the story he was telling. Some of the witnesses that the police interviewed had obviously been manipulated by Russell Bath, but Russell Bath actually dug himself deeper into a hole. He told one witness in New South Wales that the car that Margaret got into was black, but he told the wife that the car he got into was white. So the police knew that he was just making it up all the time. That must have been incredibly frustrating for the investigation to have this prime suspect. How did the investigation lead police to interviewing Russell's brother? Russell Bath was close to his brother, Charlie, who worked on a neighbouring property, and they spent a lot of time together. And so the police decided Charlie may know something. They turned up at a a shack where he was staying during the flood. He was staying with a friend who was a fisherman and Charlie was absolutely totally drunk. And Charlie's story was basically he said, I've told Russell not to admit to anything because if he hangs, I'll hang too. Obviously, this is a significant development. From there, how do police find more holes in Russell's story? I know they spoke with a couple, Margaret's nephew, John Bryan, his wife, Joyce. What enlightenment did they bring to the timeline? Well, they were with Russell and Margaret the night before, and they said that they were going off to the Barossa Valley via Adelaide. 
they were leaving early in the morning. Now, that fitted with Russell Barth's story. So that's all they could add to the investigation. But there were other people who came forward. Detective Flint from Renmark was out on a day off. He was visiting a neighbouring property. And one of the workers there came up to him and basically said, there's someone you should speak to. And he just gave a name, and the name was Snook. Now, Snook was a name well known in uh, Renmark, and they were involved in agriculture. So Detective Flint said, you mean Jim Snook? And the fellow said, no, his wife, Lucy Snook. What can you tell me about her relationship with Russell? Why is she an important piece in this puzzle? Well, she's a really important piece in this puzzle because after Margaret's disappearance, Russell Bath sidles up to her in the hotel and says, why don't you come up to the property and be my housekeeper? And if it all works out, I'll marry you. A exactly. story that we've heard before. Yeah, exactly the same story we've heard before. And she basically got involved with him for some months. They would go dancing together. They, they had would, an affair. And they basically had an affair. And um, once she heard about Margaret's disappearance, she felt that she had dodged the bullet, so to speak. What did Russell Barth tell Lucy Snook in their sort of courting, they're going out together, they're socialising, he's kind of promising maybe marriage in the future. But she must have known that Margaret had been in the picture. What did he tell her about his wife, Margaret? Well, he said that we were never married for a start. Is that true? That was true. They never did marry. Russell Barth had said that Margaret had left him and I think Lucy was suspicious of his tales. And then what happened was Russell gave her a ring, an engagement ring, sidled up to her in the hotel and said, how about we get married? Here's a ring. And she identified that as Margaret's ring. And that's when she thought, I can't go ahead with this. I don't believe him. She felt that he was evil and she broke it off. And she used the excuse that she was seeing another man. And that man was the man who told the detective to talk to Lucy Snook. (laughs) You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with Peter Butt about the true identity of South Australia's mysterious petrified woman. Police have so far been led on a bit of a wild goose chase, I suppose, but eventually there's an inquest looming something pretty significant happens two days before and one of the key witnesses is found dead. What happened? Well, Russell's brother, Charlie, had been to town to pick up some alcohol with a friend and they returned and basically had a a very big drinking session. Charlie had also brought back the newspaper from the day before, Saturday newspaper, and it had a story about the inquest starting in two days' time. His friend showed him the article and basically the next thing he did is he walked out uh, side of the cabin and shot himself. I suppose we need to understand here what was at stake in terms of the penalty for if Russell Bath was found guilty of murder. In South Australia at that time, what was he facing? And did it matter where he was tried? Because I know we've got this involvement, as we mentioned, between New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. Yes. Well, in those days, it was corporal punishment. Death by hanging was standard in South Australia, as it was in Victoria. But if he was tried in Victoria, there was a less chance that the death sentence would be enacted. But in South Australia it was very much likely. Charlie has taken his own life with just two days looming ahead of the inquest. Does that impact the timeline of the inquest? Is there an adjournment? That doesn't necessarily impact the inquest. What does impact the inquest is that Russell Bath 
has disappeared. He doesn't turn up to the inquest. And he's the centrepiece of the inquest and he's nowhere to be found. And so they shut down the inquest immediately and call it for another day. During that time, I should have asked you, has Russell been charged with anything? Is this, you know, the language of inquest is obviously not a trial. What are the hopes in terms of an outcome for this inquest? Well, hopes are to get to the bottom of who the petrified woman is and what happened to her. And if she was murdered, who did it? So that was the aim. Russell Bath was certainly central to everybody's imagining that Russell Bath had killed Margaret Salter. Do you have any theories on what actually happened to Margaret? Russell Bath had given them enough evidence to believe that the death occurred not at the house, but at Renmark Station that morning. It was very early in the morning. There was a train leaving at 7.30. Margaret and Russell had obviously stopped there for Margaret to get out and get on that train. That's what I believe. And uh, in that time, they got there at 6 o'clock, the train leaves at 7.30. That's when I believe she was killed. And I don't believe it was actually murder. In my mind, I believe it was manslaughter. They argued. Bath didn't want her to leave. She definitely wanted to leave. And the incident would have occurred in that car. As you mentioned, he goes missing and by the time the inquest is able to go ahead, there has been significant media attention and this is now a national story, national interest. What can you tell me about that time and the court of public opinion, the press coverage? Well, look, the press coverage is quite different from how it is today. It was being quite factual really detailed about the events. It was an extraordinary case, unusual because of the state of the body, this isolated location that it occurs, a flood. It's almost biblical, but it's not sensational like it is today. Today, it would be blown up, you know, media everywhere. There were no photographs taken at the inquest, you know, no photographs of the suspect and the witnesses. But it was covered with delicacy and intelligence. But again, at the same time, there was no interrogation of the facts. There was no interrogation, the media not forcing the police to give further details. And I think that could have helped. The whole case just sort of hit a plateau and it wasn't going anywhere. And the inquest actually didn't deliver anything other than what we already knew. And Russell did eventually appear at the inquest. Why did he come back after disappearing in the early stages? Well, we don't know what he did in between. He just disappeared. His lawyer must have tracked him down and told him, you have to turn up here, otherwise you look guilty. (laughs) He turned up, he sat there, and all eyes were on him during that inquest. He just was petrified himself throughout the whole thing, I'm sure. He looked forward. He didn't look at the witnesses. There were people he knew that were testifying against him. His life was completely destroyed. If he was innocent, it would have been terrible for him. If he was guilty, I think it would only make it, you know, obvious to him that he had no life left one way or another. What was the outcome of the inquest? the verdict in terms of identifying this woman? Well, basically, they couldn't identify her. That was plain and simple. And uh, because of that, Russell Bath walked free. It was referred to the higher court, and that's where it stalled. Was the woman buried? Was, you know, this petrified corpse laid to rest? What happened to her? About a month after the body was found, Once the autopsy was done, she was interred in a pauper's grave in Adelaide with two babies, stillborn babies, and two men. So it was a pauper's grave with five bodies. There was no gravestone to mark where she was buried. There was no family to be able to come and see her. The family never knew where she was buried, in fact. 
Let's jump forward now to 2017. How does a story like this come across your desk? Okay. I was asked by a production company to write and research a true crime animation series for the ABC called Twist. So I had to come up with lots and lots of stories. These were all Australian true crime stories. And I went looking for the non obvious stories going back in history. We could go back as far as we like. So I came across this story in particular, and I thought, this is amazing. Unfortunately, it didn't fit the brief. The brief was that it had to be a crime with a twist. Now, this was a crime without an answer, <laughs> not a twist. So I just put it aside and I thought, I'm going to come back to this case at some point. And you did come back to it. You managed to track down a living relative of the woman believed to be the petrified woman. How were you led to Margaret Ellis? Okay. It's, well, yeah, we're talking at that time, it was around about 66 years when I started to investigate it after the case broke. So that is difficult. You know, time passes and you've got generations who have even died. But I did a family tree of Margaret Salter. I discovered the Salter family. I went through all the generations. I was looking for any relative I could. I found a sort of a distant cousin who said, yes, Margaret's granddaughter is still alive, I'm sure. Her married name is Margaret Ellis. And she put me in touch with her. So I was able to contact Margaret Ellis out of the blue. I mean, she was absolutely gobsmacked because she was a little girl, eight years old, 10 years old, you know, when the case was closed. And uh, in all that time, she said, look, I've always wondered what happened to my grandmother. And I said, well, how about we meet? How about you give me some DNA? And uh, we try and get an exhumation of that body because I believe it's your grandmother. She said, I believe it's my grandmother too. And so that was the path we went along. But I also contacted the police in South Australia and I said, well, what records have you got? And they said, we don't even have any records of this case as far as we know. It's not even on the books, but tell us all about it. And um, I said, well, I've got some coronial inquest documents that I can send you. So I sent them there and they called me up and said, okay, we're going to open this case and uh, whatever you got, whatever you find out, pass it on to us and we'll do the same with you. So we've been working in tandem. I wouldn't say I'm officially helping the police, but we're having a conversation and we're talking about it at the moment, right this very moment, they're putting together a brief for an inquest. You say that you wouldn't say that you're working with them, but you have written the only account of this story that there is with your book. Through the eyes of Margaret Ellis, who, as you say, was a child at the time, I'd love to hear what she told you about her perspective of when her grandmother disappeared and when the inquest was unfolding. Did she give you any nuggets of information that surprised you? The first piece of information she gave me, she said, the police interviewed me. And I said, well, that's unusual. You were a 10-year-old or whatever it was at the time. Mm. She was eight when she last saw her grandmother, 10 when the police interviewed her. A very unusual thing for a child to be giving evidence in a murder case or suspected murder case. But she gave them the information about her last time that she saw her grandmother. She was up on the property for a number of weeks during the Christmas holidays of 1950. And she talked about the relationship with her grandmother and Russell Bath. She always believed, she said, that they were married. She didn't know that they were unmarried <laughs> until I told her. And she also told me other aspects of the family about how it worked, about how, you know, it's dysfunction. So just a reminder for listeners, Margaret Ellis's father is the tram conductor. He's the son who had the falling out with Margaret Salter, his mother, and sent her to Renmark. But there were other rifts in that family tree, weren't there? Yes, and that had a ricochet effect on this case that nobody knew. It was over religion. Margaret's father was staunchly Catholic, but the brother got married in a Protestant church. Margaret's father 
wouldn't attend the wedding. And then when the brother died a couple of years later with a young child, he didn't go to the funeral. So the family was completely split. The interesting thing about that story is that the wife of the dead brother wouldn't help the police investigation. She knew something that could have identified Margaret Salter. She could have identified the body, particularly the markings on the right side of the thigh of the petrified woman. She could have identified it because she was there when that wound occurred. And this was unknown until I came across the story and pieced together the family history. So I've passed that on to the police that we do know how the petrified woman got those marks on her leg. Those marks which we heard earlier in the episode that a nurse had identified as well. Yes, and so that means that there were two witnesses that could have identified that body. One, okay, you could say, oh, you know, this is just somebody looking for publicity. Two witnesses could have identified it, but Margaret's aunt wouldn't come forward, didn't want anything to do with it, and the case was never solved. Does it strike you that there just wasn't anyone in Margaret Salter's corner? Even what you said about the media of the day, that it was all very factual and reported on the information of the case, but perhaps there wasn't that angle really pressing for Russell Barth's truth and that Margaret had this estranged son, that she was a divorced woman, that she was living out of wedlock, that she was living in sin, that there's these conservative Catholics around her. Do you think that it could have been a lot more open and closed than it was? Yes, I guess today nothing would escape the media's attention. Nobody could escape the media pressure. If you suspect guilt, the system squeezes it out of them. The media squeezes it out of them. But in those days, it was actually quite old-worldy in as much that they were looking towards fairness. The police didn't heavy the witness. They tried to do it by the book. And if you look at the police record, it is completely by the book. They tried to catch him out with facts but they could only do so much. The fact that was missing was the identity of the body. They couldn't go any further. If you can't identify a body, you can't press a person to admit to a death. I mean, that's the way out for Russell Barth. He didn't have to admit to anything. He almost did. He almost gave up, but then he called on his lawyer and the lawyer said, these are your options. And I'm sure what he said to him is, one is the hangman's noose, and the other one is freedom. And he came to his senses and he said, I'll choose freedom. And that's what he got. What became of Russell Bath, do we know? We know, only know that he had to leave Lindsay Point, where he was working. He lost his job and he drifted off. And at some point, he found his way down to central Victoria, where he had another family. Margaret's granddaughter, who you connected with, after this came to your attention in 2017, did agree to DNA testing that you had suggested. Did that reveal anything? It revealed that the petrified woman has around about 50 to 60 living relatives. And most of them now know about their great-great-grandmother's death. And they also would like to see the body exhumed, and the case solved. Why does the body need to be exhumed to know for sure? And what's the process there of making that happen? Oh, well, the process is, is quite complex. You just don't go and dig up a body, and you don't go and dig up a body where there's four other people without getting permission. <laughs> so the police have to put together a case. They have to work out the costs. There are complexities in this because where she is buried, there is a plot of land in this cemetery in Adelaide where it's just bare earth. There are no markings of where the graves are. 
we know that she's about the fourth grave from a certain tree. It'll probably need ground piercing radar to locate the grave. And then all of those bodies have to be exhumed. They have to be separated, then analyzed for DNA. And that will be the answer we hope for. But in that, there are other complexities, such as the bodies may be compressed. So that is going to be really complex. It's very unusual, though it's not that unusual in global terms because World War I graves, mass graves, are being exhumed as we speak, and they're separating you know, the bodies, the remains, and they're identifying using DNA across that vast expanse of time over 100 years. They're identifying these people. By compressed, do you mean that there are multiple bodies in tight spaces? Well, they'd be in the one grave. In the wartime burials, they just dug a big pit and they put the bodies in. In Margaret's case, it's one standard grave where the bodies are on top. Now, I've also identified the family trees or the stories of the two men that Margaret is buried between. And their stories are sad. They have no living relatives. But that has to be taken into account as well. Who are these people? Their remains are being disturbed. But they're part of this story. So their identities are now going to be known. Their stories are going to be known as well. Do you think that there's every chance that this application will be accepted, that the body will be exhumed and answers will be reached? I'd like to think so, but it is complicated. We've already applied once, Margaret's applied once, to the Attorney General of South Australia. And that was turned down because of the complexity and the cost, I believe. But with the police now putting it as their oldest cold case of unidentified remains after the Summerton Man, which a lot of people will be familiar with the Summerton Man case, a man who was found dead on Summerton Beach in South Australia in 1948. There was no identification on his body. And for 70 years, it was one of those cases that had a mystique about it. It actually became so famous. It was a global story. Who was this man? How did he die? And basically, it's been solved by Derek Abbott, a professor at Adelaide University, who was fascinated by this case for years and years and years. And I've met him a number of times and had lots of discussions with him about it. He found a hair and uh, he had it analysed for DNA. It took over a year to analyse that one particular hair for DNA and came up with the identity. That's still going through the police DNA investigation, but it's basically a solved case. Now, the petrified woman will become the oldest cold case in South Australia that could be still solved. And so I think it's important for the police to be able to do their job and solve the crime. And I hope that the government agrees. It'll come down to, I guess, the police minister and the attorney general to have another look at this case and say, yes, let's do it. Why is it so important to Margaret's family that she is identified, that they do know for sure. What does it mean to them to have this case reopened? Well, I won't put words in their mouth, but Margaret, as a young child, she despaired at the fact that her grandmother had disappeared. And that has stayed with her for her whole life. She's in her 80s now. And she just says it would be a resolution to a mystery that's haunted her for her whole life. And what would it mean to you? You must be emotionally invested yourself now after so many years of digging. Uh, to a certain degree, I'm realistic. You can't get too emotionally involved. You've got to look at it as a, it's the business of society to come to terms with its past. I'm more interested in the process of how a society doesn't give up on the victim. That's what's important to me. I would be really happy for Margaret and her family to have it solved. For me, there are a lot of people out there who think they can get away with murder. And here's a chance to prove that you can't get away with murder. Simple as that. 
thanks to Peter for his assistance in telling this story today. And if you'd like to learn more about his findings, you'll find a link to Peter's new book, The Petrified Woman, in the episode description. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Emma Gillespie. The executive producer is Gia Moylan with assistant production by Cassie Merritt. Our audio design is by Rhiannon Mooney. From world-class podcasts to events, videos and articles, a Mamma Mia subscription gives you unlimited access to powerful stories you won't hear anywhere else. All for as little as $5.75 a month. Learn more in our episode description. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.